Welcome to SALT. So glad you all are here. Uh, I am so excited to preach for you tonight, but before I do, we have a quick video to show you. If you didn't recognize anyone in that video, that's because that's uh, Cedar Rapids Salt Company's promotion video for their fall retreat, which they did last year. And super exciting, but we're actually going to partner with Cedar Rapids this for our fall retreat. Like we're going to be, our salt companies are going to come together and we're going to uh, do one big retreat and we're going to do it at uh, East Iowa Bible Camp is that place uh, in the video. And I'm super excited for this. It's going to be an amazing time. It's not anything too serious. There's, there's Bible teaching throughout it, but uh, it's mostly just hanging out. Uh, fellowship, that word we talked about last week, there's a lot of that going on. Good food. Um, so uh, the dates for that are October 4th through October 6th, and uh, I would really love if all of us were there, uh, like seriously. There is a cost to it uh, because we have to pay for like lodging and, and they feed us throughout the whole weekend. It's, it's $90 um, and there's a link in our Instagram's bio. You can sign up. Uh, there's a code, uh, freshman15. If you type that in, it'll deduct $15. That's funny if you guys know what that means. Um, it's technically for freshmen, but Anyone could type in that code, so I'll do it that way you will. I just, I want you guys to be there. And if we'll have transportation, we'll carpool and stuff, but if, if cost is an issue, reach out to me, your C group leader. There's an email in the latest Instagram post too. Uh, we, will, we will make it happen for you. We'll get you there. So, okay. Um, tonight we are continuing our jargon series, which is, uh, if you've been here the last couple weeks, we're taking Christian jargon. So, uh, jargon would be uh, in words that only an in-group, uh, someone in an in-group would use and also understand. So we're trying to take uh, some, some of those words and explain what they mean a little bit. Um, have you ever talked to a realtor before? Um, I have... I have a couple friends that are realtors, and there's two sides to a realtor. There is their normal human self, and then there is their realtor self. And if you ever make the mistake of telling a realtor that you need a place to live, they will instantly transform, their eyes will gloss over, and they'll become realtor self, and they'll go, uh, well, I have this amazing property, but um, we'll, uh, you know, it's a seller's market, so we'll, we'll check your uh, DTI, and then, uh, you, you're, uh, we'll talk PMI and FSBO, and if you can tell, I'm looking for a place to live right now. But um, literally, they'll say a bunch of stuff, and I'm just like, does it have hot water? Like, is it, is it nice? I don't um, Sometimes, Christians can do a similar thing. We'll try to sell the gospel like we're selling a house, and we'll go about it in a confusing way because we use confusing words. So we're trying to take some of that jargon, those words, and actually uh, explain a little about what it means. And initially, my attitude about this was, it's like, oh, well, you know, the Bible uses these words, so we're going to have to use them, and we better explain what they are. We have to, because uh, otherwise they're not going to mean anything. And, 
That's true, but as I've dug into these words and the, the word we're going to talk about tonight, my attitude has completely changed. It's like, yes, we need to know what these words are if we're going to use them properly, but it's actually we get to know what these words are. My attitude has changed from having to do this task to learn to actually like, oh, there's so much beauty and meaning like, locked away in these words. And so hopefully if we do anything tonight, it's going to be unlock a little bit of that beauty and, and let it shine on us. I was having a conversation with my brother uh, not too long ago, probably a few months ago, and I must have been talking about a season in my life like, and what that was like. I don't remember exactly what I was saying, but I remember what he said, and it actually made me feel so annoying. What he said was, what's with Christians and always talking about like seasons in their life? Like We're always talking about a season we're going through, you know what I mean? Uh, like, oh, you know, uh, when I was in high school, I went through such a season of doubt, or um, you reflect on, like, I don't know, your freshman year, and you're like, that was such a season of growth for me. Uh, or the Christian guy gets a girlfriend, he's like, bro, it's such a season of blessing for me right now. Uh, you have no idea. Or you're not dating anyone, this one's for the girls, and some weirdo comes up to you, and he's like, Tell me about this like season of singleness you're in. Like, what's it like? You know, crazy. I'm also in a similar season. We should like get coffee and talk talk about it. Uh, we talk about seasons a lot. Jacob, what are you doing at Salt these days? Just mocking Christian culture is all. Um, we use these. We we talk about these seasons, but um, besides all my making fun. Uh, I do think it's sometimes overused and can be a little bit weird, but I actually think it's a beautiful thing that we recognize these words, uh, that we recognize these uh, seasons in our lives, too. Um, everyone's life is made up of, of these uh, seasons. Like not, it's not just Christians who have seasons of life. I just think we... We tend, to, we tend to recognize it a little bit, a little bit more. And I think that's a good thing because uh, these seasons are real and they're actually reflecting on them is a beautiful way to see and to realize God's active participation in our life, both past, present, and future to come. Um, and like I said, every, like, this is not just a Christian thing like having seasons of life, but uh, what I've found is that we're the, we, for some reason, talk about it, and I think there's a reason for that. Um, when, you, when you begin following Jesus, like when you put him first in, in everything genuinely, like that becomes your thing, like not a fake thing, but a real thing, uh, you begin to look at your life in a, in a thoughtful and introspective way. It becomes more real to you, your life, and you can't help it. It's kind of like waking up in a lot of ways. Because uh, if you're going to take your faith seriously, if you're going to do what you know you should do, not sometimes, but all the time, every day, uh, that requires that you live intentionally and not just go through the motions of life, just day after day. Uh, and when you do that, when you begin living intentionally, uh, you reflect on on what you do, what you're doing, and, and what you've done also. Now, life in general um, has, like, like, you reflect on the, on the path you're on, the paths you've been on, and, like, where that's going to lead. Um, life in general, but college especially, has certain paths lined out for you, and the easiest thing always, almost always, is to, to walk on any of those paths, right? It could be the, the drinking, hooking up thing. It could be the, a path to athletic success. It could be the path to academic success, which is definitely the lamest one. Um, there's the path to social success, whatever it may be. There's innumerable paths there. Um, I will tell you that most universities do not offer a path to Jesus. Just, it's not in the curriculum. Um, but even if it is, even if it is, there's some of us here who go 
to an amazing school right down the street that is centered around Christ, and that's, that's an incredible thing. But even there, and if you go there, you, you know this, that even there, there are paths, other paths for you that do not lead to Jesus. And those paths are always easier to, always more natural to walk than the narrow path to God. But if we're going to walk on that narrow path to God, we have to get on it. Right? We're not born on that path. None of us start out pursuing Jesus. That's something that happens. And so if we're going to get on that narrow path, we have to make the uh, intentional decision to live differently. Um, I, had a, I had a landscaping job once when I was younger, like 17, 18, and um, maybe I was a little older. I can't remember, but I I, st- I got the job initially just to do it. I just I was just it was something to do. I was getting paid. I was just going through the motions, right? Um, and then some point along uh, the way, and it didn't take long. I actually realized I liked uh, landscaping. Like I actually really enjoyed it. I still enjoy doing it. Um, I sort of decided that, and I like to use the language of decision because. Uh, not every part of it was, I didn't love all of it, right? There's things that uh, are terrible about landscaping. I, I don't do well in the sun. I, uh, there's like my, I don't know, you have to lift heavy bricks. Uh, you get dirty. But the good parts of landscaping, it's like smoothing out the mulch and getting the pavers nice and straight. Like I decided that the good parts of it were worth the hard parts. And so um, I realized I liked this thing. And when I When I realized that, I started actually paying attention to what I was doing. Like I started thinking, I didn't just go home and forget about the day and black out. Like I uh, was considering what I did during the day and how to do it better. And um, I started doing it intentionally. It was more like living than vegetating. And that was a very uh, poor illustration to say that. Uh, when we start following Jesus, like truly, we begin to do spiritual life intentionally. Like we wake up in a lot of ways. And spiritual life, of course, has implications on our whole life. It's not like a, a corner, something we tuck away. It, you could say it uh, fills every, every part of our life. And when we start doing spiritual life intentionally, we reflect on our past and we see that it's not linear. Like our lives are not a line, either constantly getting better or constantly getting worse. And they're also not just, it's not just ups and downs along that line. You're, it's not that simple. You're more complicated than that. Like we can't sum up our lives. If you're on your deathbed and someone's like, your grandchildren are like, tell me about life. I hope you have more to say then. You know, there were good times and bad times, right? There were, although that's true, uh, again, you, are, you may think you're a simple man, but like you're a spiritual and emotional being, and you are more than just ups and downs, good times and bad times. Our lives, everyone's life, consists of something a lot, less like that, and a lot more like seasons. And we may perceive good times and bad times, of course, but it's, it's not as simple as that. Like, life never is. Um, winter, for example, sucks. It's super cold. Uh, it's, it gets so cold here, sometimes I think that if I was an alien traveling around the solar system looking for a planet to inhabit, and I landed here in January, I'd be like, nope, on to the next one. Like, this, no, nothing can exist here, pack it up. Um, but that's not true, is it? Like, winter is a harsher, crueler season, but there's beauty to it nonetheless. And though it is cold and frozen, life flourishes all the more. 
here's, here's what I'm saying, is that um, every season of life, like every season of nature, has purpose. Real, God-given purpose. God puts us through tough seasons, through cold winters, not just to harden us up and not just to grow us, though there's truth to some of that. Uh, The reason why he takes us through these seasons, which we've all been through, uh, is actually because he loves us and because he uses joy and suffering, right? Summer, winter, and, and fall every season to, to do something incredible in us, to begin and see through a, a process in us, and that process is called sanctification. Um, I know I said my jargon word was seasons tonight, but I'm, I'm switching it now. It's now sanctification. Um, maybe some of you know what that word is and use it all the time. That would be those kids down the street. Um, Maybe some of you have never heard it before, and uh, I would say most of the world would fall into that camp because this is like a this word is as jargon as you get. It's literally like from the Bible, and I've never heard it used outside of a church uh, salt Christian context. And uh, it's definitely a weird one, probably the weirdest one we'll we'll have, but it's arguably the most important one too. Sanctification, if we're going to have a definition for it, is the process of being made perfect. If you want like a super biblical definition, you could say the, you know, the ongoing work of, the, of God's Spirit inside us to shape us and mold us and make us more like His Son, like Jesus, more holy. But for tonight, let's, let's say it is the process of becoming more perfect. This would be sanctification. Um, sanctification, again, is the process of being made more perfect. And so to be sanctified is to be perfect. So there's a distinction there, right? To, to be sanctified is to be perfect, period, done, complete. And then sanctification is that ongoing process of becoming more and more perfect. And it happens in in the hearts and the souls and the lives of people who are truly following Jesus, who are putting him first and who have received his spirit as a sign and seal of that. And it is that spirit which works in us, shaping us and molding us, uh, and over time making us more and more perfect. I'll try and explain this a little bit, and I'll use myself as an example because I don't know who else to pick on, but Um, When I got saved, um, saved was our jargon word at kickoff, so I'll use it freely. When I got saved, I was a a very imperfect person, and not in a funny way, like uh, very bad, full of sin. I was uh, was 18, so seven-ish years ago. Um, As I stand before you tonight... Now, I am a very imperfect person. Right? I, am, I am still a sinner. But I will say, to, to illustrate this process of sanctification, and this is not a boast, and we'll read why it's not a boast, but um, as I stand before you tonight, I am less of a sinner than I was. Um, I might get in trouble with the language here, but if if this makes any sense, like I am less imperfect than I was. Now, sanctification is not a process in which uh, we try really hard and we we behave better and better, and then at some point in our 80s or or something, we reach that state of sinless perfection. No. Um, The 80-year-old who has been faithfully following Jesus for all their days, they had been, they would tell you, no, I'm still a sinner. I'm still imperfect. That, that sinless perfection is not something we reach in this life. Uh, sanctification is a process which ends in, in heaven. Uh, but the reason why we could look at that 80-year-old uh, and see them as perfect, like a 
that, that person does not sin. That person just does all the right things. Um, the reason why we might perceive that to be the case is because of this process of sanctification. Is because that, that 80-year-old has had more years to walk with Jesus. They've had more years to deal with their sin. They've become, uh, they've become wise at recognizing uh, what their weaknesses are, and they've become skilled at fighting uh, temptation and conquering it as well. I had a wise person once tell me, told, tell me that the whole idea behind sanctification is that we would sin, uh, that our sins would be less and that we would sin less often. And what he was saying by that is that like our, our sins today, if we've been walking with Jesus, if we've been pursuing him and putting him first, uh, should not be, like we should not go back to the sins of our youth. We should, we should grow from there. We should know better. We should learn as we walk with Jesus. And we should let uh, his grace teach us uh, right and wrong as it tends to do. Um, our worst sins sh should be behind us and then we should sin less often too. Like we should break the pattern of sin in our lives. Uh, it should not become a it should not have a grip on us like it once did, is basically what I'm trying to say. If you are following Christ, like these, this evil in your life that you came out of like should not have a hold over you, should not have dominion over you, and it doesn't. As we learn to obey the words which God writes on our hearts, we become less and less prone also to doing those things which, which we once did. Now hear me out, there is, uh, there is endless grace though, um, even when we revert back to those old sins. If you know my story, you know that that's a part of my story. It's like I'm, I'm guilty of that. And I struggled for a long time to understand how I, someone who knew better, could have grace. Like how could there be grace for someone who knows what to do and then chooses not to do that thing. Um, but there is grace. And I stand before you as a witness to that grace. It's like it's, it's real. It's powerful. Even when we think we're unforgivable. And also this, this is all used in this process of sanctification to grow us and make us more skilled like that old person at fighting sin. And we need to be getting better. We need to be, to be on this path because uh, winter is coming. Like cold seasons are still ahead. Like we're young, and as old people like to say, like you have your whole life ahead of you, right? We, we have most of our lives before us, so chances are the, you know, the hardest years are still yet to come. Winter is coming but hear me here, a, a bad season does not mean God has left you. It feels that way. It feels that way because we often make the decision to leave God. Like, I'm going to do my own thing now. I'm going to go back to what I, uh, what I know. And uh, in that we sense that we, we leave God, but I'm, I'm telling you, he does not leave us even in those seasons. And also, like, feeling bad is not, it's not being bad, too. Even if you're trying to follow Jesus and, and you're just in this season of whatever it is, doubt, uh, fear, um, questioning everything, temptation, it's like, feeling bad is not being bad. My sister likes to say that Feelings are good servants, but really terrible masters. And what, what she means is that feelings can serve us, and they teach us about ourselves, about our own emotions, and they also teach us about life and the world and others. They serve us in that way. 
but they are terrible masters. One, they don't, they don't have to master us, but when we let them master us, uh, they, we, we live a lie and we believe lies, like, oh, because I'm going through a cruel season, I have to be cruel to everyone around me, or because it's cold outside, I have to be cold to everyone I encounter. It's not true. And our feelings don't have to master us. I want us to recognize that for the person putting Jesus first, for the person following Jesus, bad things, bad seasons, we, we go through them. God brings us through them as part of his incredible plan to sanctify us. Like those bad seasons are part of God's plan to make you more perfect, more like Jesus. And I can't say, I don't, I'm not skilled enough to tell you all like how that is the case for you. You could tell me about a season you've been through or are in right now, and I'd be like, whoa. Like I have, I have no idea how God is using that to make you more perfect. I, have, I can't say but I can tell you he is. But I can tell you Romans 8.28 that um, all things work together for the good of those who love God. It has purpose. Jesus gives pain purpose. Um, and we shouldn't let winter depress us. We should see that God is using it to sanctify us, to grow us and make us more perfect, even when it looks and feels like it's killing you, which it so often does. If you look at a forest in winter, it looks dead and suffering. But trees shed their leaves in winter so that life will remain in its roots. I know I said our lives are not linear, like our lives are not just a line. We're more complicated than that. But if our lives were a line, um, day to day, on the ground, it would seem like all it is is just ups and downs. And that there's no real progression toward anything, let alone perfection, probably the opposite, because it just keeps fluctuating. Like I'm on fire for Jesus, or I'm doing well, and then, and then I'm not. And like Monday was great, Wednesday was bad. And that's what it seems like. Can you show the first chart? Um, just... Nothing really happening. But for the person following Jesus, if you zoom out on their life, which is hard to do, right? but that's what God sees. If you zoom out on their life, you will see that though everything definitely was not perfect day to day, that there was a progression, a consistent progression toward perfection. Um, that's literally the S&P 500, by the way. Um, <laughs> okay, so what do you do, though? Like, Jacob, you're telling me that I just, just follow Jesus and he'll make me more and more perfect? I mean, kind of, that, that is what I'm telling you, but I know it's not that simple. Like, nothing in life ever is. It's hard. It takes humility. We have to be willing to accept that we are not good. We are definitely not perfect. And that goes against the grain of like what the world will, will say. And world is actually our jargon word next week. I didn't mean to use it, but um, you could say society. It's like this goes against the grain of, of what we're told. We are told that we are good. Like at our core, we are good. Um, that we are worthy and that uh, you don't need to change because you are perfect just the way you are. Now, the gospel, which if you can see is more loving, the gospel uh, says something a little different from that. 
Okay, it's actually the exact opposite from that. It's saying that you are uh, not good, that you are definitely not perfect, and it's actually offensive. It's saying like you, you need to change. And it goes one step further than that and says, and you can't change on your own. You cannot change because you are so stuck in your ways. So the, the language the Bible uses is that you are dead in your sin, which is saying that you have as much chance of becoming perfect on your own as a dead body does at coming back to life on its own. Like it doesn't happen. But, right, it's a big but, Jesus was good, was, is worthy, and is so perfect that we can't even understand it. And because of a great sacrifice, which he made for us, and we're, we'll talk about that next week, but because of that, we actually get to share in his goodness, in his perfection, in his worthiness. We get to be what he is in a strange and mysterious way. A good way to illustrate this is that if, if Jesus' goodness and worthiness and perfection was a robe that only he can wear, that only he can earn, he, he takes off that robe and gives it to you to wear. And you get to put it on. And when he does that, he actually takes your dirty, gross, nasty clothes and takes them for you and lets you wear his robe forever. He doesn't take it back. And that changes you. Like if you've had that exchange with Jesus, you know that it changes not only your outside, what, what other people see, but also your inside. What, what God sees. This is this is, this is our sanctification right there. Like this is a work of God. And it's not so much us like learning and growing, though it is, but it's, it's much more like God working in us, shaping and molding us as we follow him to, to make us what he wills us to be. It's not, we can't, we can't brag about it. Right? We can't boast. I, uh, I s stood up here and said, like, I'm less of a sinner than I was when I was 18, but that has nothing to do with me in reality. It feels like it does. Like, I feel like I'm working with Jesus, and we're, like, together, like, me and him getting there, but it's really, <laughs> it's him, because if you remove Jesus from the picture, uh, my progression is not more perfect. It's, it's the other way. We can't boast. Um, first Corinthians, I'm sorry this is the first time we're reading the Bible tonight. Uh, we will read much more Bible in the future. I just had so much to say. Um, first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective. Not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became wisdom from God for us. Our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end on this. Um, When we follow Jesus, this is going to be the confusing part. Bear with me. When we follow Jesus, we, uh, we become, we, we step, 
by his power, begin this process of sanctification, of becoming more and more perfect. But, this is very important we realize this, that at the same time, we are already sanctified. Christ's work on the cross, again, we'll talk about this next week, was final, once and for all, complete, period. We don't, we don't add to it by becoming more and more perfect. And we don't get any more and more saved. Um, the Spirit of God teaches us to recognize sin in our lives, and helps us get better and better at, at fighting it, at, at conquering it, by giving it to Jesus. But we do that knowing that Jesus has already conquered it, has already done away with it once and for all. Right? We're learning to conquer sin knowing Jesus has conquered conquered it. Um, this is confusing because it makes no sense at all, but the, the nerds would describe sanctification as a twofold thing. It's, it's transformative and it's positional. So it's transformative is in that it transforms us to be more and more perfect over time, that process of sanctification. But it is positional in that it, it takes us from the position of enemy of God and moves us to the position of child of God. And that's a right away thing. The grace of God has no probation, period. We go from sinner to saved immediately. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get there. You don't earn it. You don't have to be good for a certain amount of time. You are sanctified when you give your life to Jesus. You go from a, a sinning sinner to a, a saved sinner, if that makes any sense. Like over time, as you, as you trust and obey Jesus, he shapes you to be more and more like him through good seasons and bad seasons, cold seasons and warm seasons. But he does that and also tells you that, hey, you right now in Christ Jesus are exactly who I want you to be. I don't have a good illustration because it's so confusing. I'm thinking of like a, a toddler learning to walk. It's like the parent's not mad because he's or she's like not there yet, but um, that, that parent would, would love that child all the same if it never walked. I, I don't know, but um, I, wish, I wish I could make things more clear. I'm actually learning this stuff too. And I think I'll probably, like, never figure it out. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has, but um, nothing is more clear and more true to us than, than God's Word. And I want to read a, to close, and I'll, we'll go right into prayer. I want to read a passage to you guys, kind of over you guys. It's not going to be on the screen, where uh, it, it's about this weird, confusing, seemingly contradictory, how... God is working in us and on us uh, while the work is already done. Um, how we can be saved and a, and a sinner. Um, so if it's not too weird, if you guys would stand. Um, John's going to play some music. I'm just going to read this as we close. The passage is Romans chapter 6. He writes, uh, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. This passage is going to use the language of slavery, which is 
off-putting to us, but the, he's talking about like who's your master? Like what, what is it that masters you? For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your body, making you obey its passions. Do not present your body to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your body to God as an instrument for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself as anyone that's obedient to sin, you are slaves? You are slaves to the one whom you obey, and you have two options, either of sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. And the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we thank you uh, that you have not chosen to leave us to our own devices, that you have not chosen to allow us to get worse and worse, but in Christ Jesus you make us more and more perfect, and we thank you for that. I pray we could keep this, that you would make us wise to understand that Yes, we're, we're being shaped and, and molded by you, but also that like the work is done. That Jesus died for us in our place, and that was a once and for all sacrifice. Lord, thank you for taking me from, uh, from an absolute sinner to uh, a saved one. And I pray if there's anyone here tonight, Lord, that you're, you're pressing in on their hearts, on their sin, whatever it may be, Lord, I just, I pray you would cause them to lean in, to open up. God, we don't pray away hard seasons. We, we ask that you would sanctify us through them. We ask for grace and peace to see you in them. And may we be a witness to the whole earth that you are good and that you work all things for good for those who love you, God. And we love you. And we pray this all in your name. Amen.